Welcome to another version of the podcast, The Research to Reps Roundtable. Joining me is co-host Dr. Ernie Reimer. How's it going, Dr. Reimer? Good. I just can't get over Corey Kennedy's sweater. He's going to shift down so people can see the sweater action. The baseball-themed Jose Bautista bat flip. Nice. Mm -hmm. Merry flipping Christmas. I love it. Christmas. I love it. I love it. It's good to meet you, Corey. I've read a little bit about you and excited to get to know a lot more about you. Um, Ernie, how's it going over there with you? How was uh, holidays? How was Christmas? How was everything with the kids and presents and things like that? Santa Claus went big this year and our, our first Christmas in Kentucky. That's all I can say. Delivered. Kids are excited? Kids are excited? Yeah, they were bouncing off the walls. They... They heard the clatter. They didn't come out to see what was going on, but they woke up and there were lots of presents under the trees. Win-win. Yeah, I love it. And and on what, 70 degrees? And he's still, you know, without snow, Santa still made it. Santa made it. <laughs> he's got skills. He's got skills. Well, do you, guys, want, do you guys normally get a lot of snow in Louisville? Sorry, I'll, I, I'll delay the start, official start here. You know, this is my third Christmas here, and it's been different every year. Got it. Um, so I, I know we get ice. We don't get a lot of snow, but I know we get a lot of ice. And yeah. um, last year, I remember having the ice pick the driveway it's like three quarters to an inch of ice. I, I, I literally had an ice pick. Wow. Yeah, that's a tough, tough sledding. Sometimes easier to push the snow aside, but when you got to get rid of a whole sheet of ice like that, it's not. It's not I've, I've taken your advice. I have ice or salt ready. Well, it's not really salt, but I'm ready. I'm ready for when that time comes. You know, so, that's, that's going to be good for you. Good exercise for you, Arnie. You're going to like it. I have a spreader and... It, it, it'll be light work, but at least I know that the, the, the calcium magnesium acetate that I got is environmentally friendly. Did you special order that? I did. Nice. Yeah. I need to get that link from you. I need to get that link. Well, Corey, your background is very interesting. And I think, can you give our listeners a little taste of what it is to live the life of Corey Kennedy. I can, I can do that. I, I have that skill. So um, thank you for having me. First of all, I appreciate being here. Um, as far as my background goes now, uh, living my life is mostly in Arizona, um, not too far from where a young Ernie Reimer grew up. Actually, he was in Southern Arizona. Uh, I visited his, his hometown actually last earlier in the year, I think. But now it's based in Arizona with the Chicago Cubs doing uh, baseball. Currently, I'm at my, we'll call it off-season residence, which is uh, in Canada. It's more like a, think of it as like a vacation home kind of thing. It's on, on the lake, on Lake Ontario. Um, we, have, we have a big property, and, and you can see behind me, it's, it's very rustic feel still. Wood stove in the main uh, cottage. This is kind of a, a guest room that I turn into my office when I'm at home. Um, so... It's kind of like a, a beautiful place to unwind and unpack. It's very rural, very, very um, nature oriented. But for the moment, I, I don't sample it as much as I'd like because I'm so far away. Um, but it's the kind of thing that my wife and I decided would be sort of ours for as long as we want. You know, it's the kind of place that you're always going to want to go back to uh, during your career in life, no matter where we end up in, in the world or North America. Um, and then... But before that, I was, uh, I was in Montreal doing Olympic sports before the Cubs. And that was a really, really cool job for six years because I got to sample so many different types of sport, types of athletes, uh, got to travel all around the world, um, got to cross paths with, with Dr. Reimer a handful of times. Um, and that was, I'd say I'd, I, I learned more in that job than I think most people do in, in five, six years in, in one spot, just because so many exposures to we'd have sports that came in for just camps and that we're talking about testing um and then we're figuring out how to test 
a different sport, trying to give them a new test battery that might be more up to date with different technologies. We had sports that were at our center full time, getting ready for world championships, Olympics, et cetera. Some of them had junior programs. So you're talking about how do I transition this, the 16 year old up to, you know, an Olympics eight years from now. Um, so really there was just summer and winter. There was just so many different exposures. And then staff wise, we had people who are physiologists by trade, biomechanists by trade, obviously the medical field, strength and conditioning, and then sport coaches that um, it was just very fruitful discussions, collaborations, um, and I'd say innovation. So that's, those are the big pieces of, of my background. I've had other stuff that I did before that. And I, I was a college football player in Canada in my uh, undergrad days. So that was my, my first foray into competitive sport was actually football. So now I haven't really coached in football since then. So everyone always goes, Oh, were you a baseball guy? And it's like, no, I was, I was a football guy. And then in the Olympics, I was none of those things. So yeah, uh, it was, it was interesting, but I think I, I always enjoy having different experiences in different sports, but um Dr. Pat, you you were football for a while in Missouri, and now you go oversee a lot of sports. Did you do a lot of different sports before Missouri, or is this now your foray into lacrosse and rowing and running and track? What's I would that? say, yeah, I would say as a as an intern, as a graduate assistant, as a full time assistant, I worked with a lot of different sports, and as a young director, I tried to be as involved as I could as well. Um, for, I remember being a first time director and having my first exposure with the sport of rowing. And I, I found it fascinating. I wrote a, a training article on rowing, even though I was not training rowing. Um, right. I was I was the director. So I, I was I've always been fascinated by those other sports and the different aspects of athleticism and the crossover. To me, that's that's really that's really big. Um, I had a chance to play pro, so I saw the best of the best. And and I always was fascinated how the best of the best, not just the football player, but the best yeah. athletes, like how did they get that? But beyond genetics, I mean, obviously yeah. you got to have really good genetics, but what what was their background? And I always found that sports or just playground, playing, how, how big that was when it comes to developing athleticism. And, and when you look at like a, a top level athlete, what they have in their background. So. Um, well, what about you, Ernie? You, you did U.S. ski and snowboard for a while, but now you've been around in sports science. You've been around a lot of sports. What, what kind of sticks out to you the most with. Yeah, I, th I think that the, I mean, obviously I've, I've been, in a few different environments, you know, I started out as a strength conditioning coach and I was more of, I've, I was always one of the more academic and cerebral types and had a natural affinity for science. And once I discovered that sports science could actually be a thing, that's when I recreated myself as a sports scientist at the end of my tenure at the U.S. ski team. But very similar to you, you know, I went to the ski team, I was drop shipped into this very innovative forward thinking problem solving environment and was introduced to a lot of concepts first of all i'd only skied two days in my life and found tremendous success with alpine skiers as a professional and i really the environment just really opened my eyes though because you solve a lot of problems beyond sets and reps to help athletes be successful. And it was just such a cool eye-opening experience. And I realized maybe this type of problem solving ability and can solve issues in mainstream American sport. And I feel that college is a great environment for me because you have so many different sports, really high level athletes, a lot of different disciplines who you get to work with, but you also have the academic universe. And it's been really fun to try to navigate that. But I guess one question I might have for you though, is because you were a football player, you worked in the Canadian system and now you're working with baseball players. Like what, what are the unique traits in a sports performance professional that you 
see are necessary for someone to literally jump in to different environments, working with sports that maybe you've never even had exposure to? Yeah, I think the the number one thing is sort of a, a combo of humility and curiosity. And that's being able to stop and really try and, you know, uh, Dr. Pat talked about writing an article about rowing when he first got exposed to it, because I'm sure he was looking like, what goes into this? What's out there? What's the research on this, right? And the moment that you can start asking, and, and the research is big, but I think asking the coaches a lot of questions and being able to just say, look, I, I'm a football player, like tell me more about rowing and, and leaning on them. Because one of the things I found fascinating is that in all these different sports, the sport coach will have like, I'll call it like a slice of SNC that they're really good at because of their sport. Like I remember same with you, Dr. Pat, when I was working with a little bit with rowing, kind of helping some strength and conditioning, some consulting, and also canoe kayak, I found those two sets of coaches were insanely dialed into like the energy system stuff, uh, like how much time they're doing on water in all their different phases. And they would even, they were so used to prescribing a lot of that stuff off water when they were, you know, in season, out of season for extra conditioning and stuff. And I, I went and I was like, man, I, I don't think I want to even bother bringing up energy system development because this guy's crushing it. Like this guy's got this so locked down. I, I can almost just talk about the weight room stuff and just learn more from him about how they structure that. And um, so I think being able to understand that, like the sport coach, the people that are in it, and then also books and, and, and research out there that there's, there's got to be aspects of the sport that are beyond general. Uh, I think obviously if you're really good with the general concept of strength and conditioning, we know there's a lot of transfer, but being able to really find out right away, what are those niches where it's like, man, this is what makes a, an Alpine skier special. And, you know, whether that's these eccentric leg strength or plyometrics or whatever, it's going to end up being about their legs mostly or different positions. Then you go like, how do I learn about that from the coach and from the athletes and, and, and then have anything that's written. So to me, the, the biggest thing about getting into new sports and hopefully being successful is, is that curiosity and being willing to put your ego aside that someone who's already doing it probably knows most of the answers, right? And, and even in baseball, it's like, I can go to the pitching department if I want to learn about pitching and not necessarily waste too much time with like a research article on, on just like, you know, the ulnar collateral ligament, even though I need to figure that stuff out they can kind of already give me a head start with the practical stuff without me pretending like I already knew everything about baseball before walking in the door, because it wasn't true. And um, I think that's hard to do sometimes, even though I say that it's important, it's not a, a simple thing to go in and tell someone like we're hired as an expert, right? And it, they tell you, we brought in the new expert here, everybody, he's joined the team. He's the head of X, head of Y. And then to go to a coach and then go, I don't know if I know what I'm talking about with regard to this little thing. It's a very vulnerable feeling because you're, you're trying to impress your colleagues too. You don't want to come in there being like, they made a mistake. I don't know what I'm talking about. So it's a, it's a weird tightrope to be curious and humble and still sound like, you know what you're doing. And I think that's something you should always try to do, but it, I can understand why it doesn't always happen. You know? Yeah. You answer my next question. I was going to ask, how do you do that? What are the components that you need to be able to walk into that situation. And you mentioned humility. You mentioned being a learner, asking questions. Um, that is easy. Most people understand that, but but actually doing it in the moment um, when your insecurities start kicking in, mm -hmm. that's that is difficult. Um, you you talked about the uh, rowing coaches or canoe coaches. The most in-depth conversation I ever had on periodization was with the rowing coach. I mean, getting on the dry race board, drawing out all 52 weeks and like going into like Tudor Bampa's periodization charts and with the rowing coach, it was, it was rewarding. Um, and, and yet I've worked with some more, I say higher profile coaches and we don't get anywhere close to that. And so how do you balance that? And I want to know how you do it as well, Dr. Reimer. Yeah, you go, Ernie, you go next. Okay, great. Well, it, it's a similar approach. I mean, 
I, I think at the end of the day, we're service providers. And what I try to bring is a scientific skill set. And it, it's a lot of a lot of times people want to know what it is you're going to do to help them be successful in some way. And unless you've been working in a given sport or area or niche for quite some time, you don't have that answer. And, and if you do, you may be missing the bullseye because if you come in, you're brand new and you're like, I have the solutions to all your problems. And when you haven't even stopped to say, well, what are the issues and challenges you're facing? There's a really good chance that maybe you are a know-it-all. Instead, I, I take the approach and just ask, what is it that you're working on? And how can I use my skill set to benefit your program? And when we can get people to start thinking like that, that's where I found a lot of traction because at least I'm, I'm in a new job. I've been here for four months and that's how a lot of my conversations go is how are you going to help me win? And, and I say, well, honestly, I don't know. I'm, I'm just a scientist. And, and most people think that scientists know everything when in fact, the essence of science is the quest for knowing. So we don't actually know anything, but I have this really cool skill set, and I might be able to help you. What are you trying to work on? And suddenly the baseball coach shares with me some of the challenges they're facing spends two and a half hours doing it too, by the way, on it, I canceled all my afternoon meetings because he wanted to sit down and chat. And all of a sudden I'm like, Hey, let me cancel this next meeting. Oh, Hey, let me cancel this other thing. I'm going to, I like where this is headed. So we're going to, we're going to stick this out learn and, and find some initiatives where I might be able to help our baseball team. Same thing with the rowing coach. He actually did have a dry race board. He calls me in and I thought maybe he was going to call in some of the support staff and assistants. Nope. He closes the door and he starts laying out like 10 different things he wants help with. And where we settled was single leg cycling as an alternative mode of training for the rowers. So at least he grabbed onto that and he understood it right away. We did a session together. So he knew what it felt like. And I was reminded of what it felt like, felt like, and it wasn't fun. And now he's implemented that as, as part of their take home programs, because it's something as rowers can do. And, and he understands the physiology behind it. So it makes sense to him, but with each sport and even support staff area, they, if you can flip the conversation, find out what it is they're looking to do, there's a chance that you can identify both the short-term benefit that you can offer as well as the long-term benefit, which may require a lot more work. And it's been, it's been pretty fulfilling. And, and I might like throw that at you, Dr. Pat, similarly, just to, you know, moving from like strength and conditioning into administration, what challenges did you face moving into a new environment like that? Probably number one is are the preconceived notions that you have of what it would be like to be in this type of role. I mean, we've all had those conversations about one day I want to be in a high performance position or a coordinator of all these health and performance areas, whatever it's called. And then you get in that position and you realize the challenges that are there are not ones that you were exposed to as a strength and conditioning coach, that you weren't exposed to them in the weight room. The weight room really is a, it's almost fixed con compared to everything else that I work with. The way you, you have, who sets the schedule? The strength and conditioning coach. Um, who sets the groups? The, the strength and conditioning coach. Um, the, the, free, the frequency of when we run and lift, the strength and conditioning coach. So a lot of things were determined in the weight room um, the athlete schedule was a lot of things determined in the weight room outside of their class schedule. And now being in this role as an administrator, I am almost always reacting to someone else's schedule, um, someone else's goals, someone else's um, dreams, uh, their, their mission and vision. I, I am the person that is, hearing what direction they want to go and, and seeing where, where those intersections are between all the areas that I work with and how I can be, how I can help everyone navigate moving in the same direction. So it's, it's a, a lot more management than, than there's a lot more management than I was expecting. 
I was prepared for the leadership of this mm-hmm. role, but the management is something that I've had to step back and almost be a little bit more reactive and, and take things as they come rather than trying to be so proactive that I'm out in front of, of where different individuals or departments are. And then, yeah. then they don't feel this, that I'm listening to them and I'm not being supportive. Yeah. That's super what, interesting. Yeah. What, what about you, Corey? You know, I think the, the biggest thing, and, and you would have had this as a director, um, is learning, you know, when you're not the practitioner anymore, you know, you think about like the coaching each rep and, and getting the skill and getting the sets and reps and, and the stimulus down. And now as I get more and more staff, you know, I have conversations with front office about things that some of our strength coaches just won't ever talk about or have that conversation or we don't even want them thinking about, you know, and you have to now be okay with not being the practitioner because, you know, we, we, you spend years trying to be really good at that. And then now you have to say, I'm going to let someone else do that. And I'm now responsible for like the final outcome. And you're starting to have strategic conversations with the front office and say, Hey, I can get a guy on that and we can make that start to happen. And you have to, it's a different satisfaction to say it's getting done versus I did it. You know, and I found that was the first thing of being able to like step back and say like, I don't need to coach that guy, you know, and the Cubs is it's, it's a big organization. We have 180 minor league players stateside plus your 26 major leaguers. And then you also have an Academy in the Dominican Republic. So we have you know 250 players. Um, and, you know, when you see them get to the bright lights of Wrigley Field, it's a great feeling to be like, I worked with that guy. It's hard to give that away and say, no, I'm going to let someone else work with that major league guy and, and do that because I have to have these other conversations and I have to get with the pitching department about strategically how, what we want a pitcher to look like. And then we figure out down the line, what that looks like sets and reps and another coach can deliver that. And I found, you know, kind of like what you're saying about your management and figuring out how to adjust that. I think there's a, a certain ego bit that you go like, man, I want to be the one to coach him how to sprint or how to lift or how to do it ever. So then to step back and say, no, it's more strategic. And, and it's about making sure that, you know, the, the saying about the garden, you're there to make sure the garden grows rather than make one individual item yourself. So that to me has been, the most interesting, I think in the Olympic system, I had a small staff, but I was still, you know, pretty much full-time a practitioner on the floor. So kind of like what Ernie, um, you know, Ernie and I were talking about this recently about that transition of saying like, I'm the guy that's going to come in and solve you your problem. I'm going to take the measure. I'm going to crunch the data and I'm going to tell you the answer versus I'm going to figure out how do we solve the problem 12 times at the same time. They are at every level of minor league baseball or for all the teams in the university. And that's, it's a weird position to say, wow, there's a lot of value in this, but I'm no longer the guy that gets to go, ha ha, I have the answer for you. Ernie Reimer did this or Corey Kennedy did this. And so I found that's been the most interesting transition is trying to empower others to be the one that maybe gets the great relationship with the player because he's the guy who just did the training and the player loves him. And you're like, I'm so happy to see that. That's great. But early in your career, you go, I worked with an Olympian. That was the most amazing thing ever. Or I worked with an All-American or I did whatever. And it, you know, building those relationships always feels gratifying. But then you have to say, like, now I got to let someone, I want someone else to build that relationship. And I'll build a different one, you know. Ernie, did I paint that story about you fairly correctly? Or is that, uh, did I put words in your mouth incorrectly there? No, I, I think that that's, <laughs> that's a, a, a pretty good point. I mean, that's been one of Dr. Ivy's big things as a director is to truly direct and not do. And we have scaled from, you know, a small unit of about four people at the beginning of the semester. And I, I, I anticipate we'll have 10 people involved with our sports science unit here going into the spring. And one of the big challenges is that when someone presents an issue and you know what the answer is, but to get to the answer, it's going to require some work. The path of least resistance would be, well, I'm going to do that work. But really the challenge is how can I help the ones who are actually going to do the work, see the promise in this, and then maybe 
join forces with them just long enough to model the work so that they can see it and then run with it. Yeah. And that, that's been really, really unique. And at every corner, I find myself resisting the temptation to I just dive in and do it when what I really need to do is maybe just model enough of it and introduce it to enough people who can run with it and, and see the benefit in it. And so that's been, that's been really, really interesting, but you know, this is the research to reps round table. So I would, I'd be curious, Corey, I mean, you talked a little bit about it, like what pitchers are supposed to look like and things like y- you are, you, your background is in the sports sciences and you do have a scientific approach. And I know this, like what, what type of novel solutions are you allowed to share with your new role or have you been able to provide instances where maybe you've been able to bring research that has been published and, and has been fairly mainstream and maybe some other areas where you've been able to bring that to baseball or what type of research are you doing where you're truly bringing the research the data you're collecting into real life practice with the players? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so first I, I brought a bunch of different things. One of the things I was able to bring was a combination of a published research uh, on a number of topics. Cause as you said, I, that's something I've dove into quite a bit in the past and um, other was just strategies that were parallel in Olympic sport. And I'll give a, an example I'll give you that the outcome doesn't matter, but I came in and we were talking about a few different things around pitching. And um, one of the first things that came to my mind was um, when I was at the INS, I had one of our coaches on our staff. I had hired him while he was in his master's and um, he was trying to, he was kind of spinning his tires, getting his thesis set up and done. Um, Cause at the time he was in martial arts and he wanted to do something with karate. And, um, he was trying to get enough athletes and enough things, enough things going. And then one of the, one of the problems we had, or one of the challenges we had, I guess you could say at the INS at that time was uh, we had a big fencing program that was going to be based in our center. It was a, just an absolutely gorgeous fencing um, training room that I looked at that and was like, there's training rooms for fencing like this in the world. This is crazy. When I was in university, they would throw a mat on the, the basketball court when everyone else was done, you know, and they got the corner, but Um, now this is like what worldwide fencing looks like. And they came to us and said, okay, like, how do we basically build our program from like a strength and conditioning sports science side to to build the comprehensive nature? And they had, you know, the old school PE book that was there, like push-ups in a minute, you know, sit-ups in a minute, you know, all these things that we were like, oh man, we could do better than this. So we, we went through a process with fencing over a year where we kind of kept tweaking their test battery to try and capture what we thought would be important KPIs for, for fencing. And then what ended up happening is that this, our assistant coach, his name is Mike Stolberg. He, he decided to flip his master's thesis and he used our fencing data to try and separate the world-class, like the elite senior national team competitors with the junior national team competitors and see if they were key attributes in our testing that would allow us to tell the difference and then in that way we would also be able to pare down the testing to the more important tests and factors and versions and one of the things we learned and if you've been around fencing you can kind of see it but it really got our our curiosity turning around how to train it was that the front leg and the back leg in in um, fencers especially later stage become very different characteristically like the front leg is much bigger than the back leg it's a lot stronger it does eccentric strength very very well because it ends up stopping and starting you a lot and the back leg is springier and it's a bit skinnier but it's more like an elastic plyo leg and the other ones I started to get us thinking about how do you taper someone for a world championship um knowing that like do you we always talk about, you know, balancing out strengths and weaknesses in, in strength and conditioning and um, just physiology in general. But we said, what about when you're close to the best comp- most important competition, do you lean in to these, these disparities and do eccentrics and landings on the front leg? And do you do lots of, you know, p- bouncing and plows in the back leg and really separate the, the asymmetry? 
Um, so that was like the back square of fencing, which um, was part of that that pathway in the Olympic sport. So when I got here, that was one of the first things I thought about with pitching. And I sat down with pitching. We were talking about different things. And I said, wow, your landing leg and your push-off leg are different. And we saw it was very different in fencing, but, um, you know, might be quite different in pitching. But let's riff on that in terms of, like, is there a more moderate version where they're still – training different qualities or or different actions and so there's research in there there's you know previous experience and there's um you know a parallel universe of a sport that doesn't look the same at all you know from you usually think baseball you go where else do they throw something and where else do they do that um but it just got us thinking about some of the problems we face about how do we get more specific for a pitcher especially maybe at the elite level in the major leagues where you're trying to tweak one thing to make them a little bit more effective versus the 17 year old you just drafted it might just be well this skinny little kid's never been in the weight room so it doesn't get to that specific yet right we might still be needing to put on size and strength so that was one uh example um now we we try to do a lot of research internally that doesn't see the light of day uh, for competitive purposes. But what we will do is we have a very strong research and development team that um, baseball, as you guys are probably aware, has had a huge amount of data on on field, especially um, it started becoming a lot more public with Moneyball. But now um, there's stuff everywhere about it. And literally every pitch, every hit, every move in a baseball stadium is is quantified and recorded and, and tracked. So we had this really strong research and development team doing baseball stuff already. And now we've developed a path, pattern of collecting high performance data, sending it to them, integrating it. And we'll quarterly, we'll say, okay, what do we think out of these four or five tests? Does anything tell us more about a hitter's ability to hit the ball harder or his ability to get a different position or a pitcher. There's all sorts of different ways we could look at them. It could be average fastball in a game versus the peak fastball velocity. Um, Cause those are sometimes a little bit different. And then it could be about command, right? Like we can measure where every pitch has been in any sort of targeted session, whether it's a bullpen or a game. So is the pitch relatively near to where it was supposed to be and things like that. So we now have this infrastructure where they have tons of data that we're just we try to build a process where we constantly revisit the data we collect to see what's still important. And if we can start to continue to tell more and more stories around, this is what it takes to go from a ball to triple a probably mm. like if we put that kind of like black suit over someone that you can't see their face and name. It's just, you're a foremost figure that you'd say, you have these characteristics. You probably need these characteristics to make it to the upper levels of the minors. And then once you start coaching them, the coach, you know, gets into some unique characteristics of the athlete, but you probably know what it's going to take to transform that version to the later version. And, and so that's kind of how we try to use research internally to drive the choices that we constantly make each year. We draft a new player. We say, okay, we think we have a better idea of where they're going to need to be, to be a comp- try to be a major league player, right? Not everyone's going to make it because of the numbers, but if we can have more players physically capable of hitting as hard or throwing as fast or running as fast as a major leaguer, then the chances are you've done your job. That's really interesting. I, I would say like one of the, the big things that I was able to, tr- the, the big bodies of research and knowledge that I was able to transfer, say from the U.S. ski team, or alpine skiing to like mainstream sport would be one like circad shifts in circadian rhythm. That's mainly because of jet lag, yeah. but those circadian shifts can happen at a more micro level as well. Just your sleep wake cycles and things. And just thinking about that, we we've had a lot of success in different, in particular team sports in the, in two different college settings where we've been able to apply some concepts there. And the other one is just the effect of, uh, the environment on the body, both cold weather and hot weather, uh, add in humidity and precipitation and surface and those things in the, in this, in the ski world, we think a lot about how the environment is going to affect the body, both right. like from a physiological standpoint, as well as more, maybe an equipment performance and a visibility standpoint and those things. And th- those were just two really big concepts where there's a lot of research that aren't readily applied 
and a lot of your American mainstream sport. And I've been able to bring a lot of that to the table, but I, I want to go back to baseball a little bit. And you talk about, you know, transitioning up, but what about, you know, what, what kind of insight, like what kind of research are you doing on the game inside the game that, you know, might be able to transfer maybe even from like an A level ball player to like a men's amateur player in particular catchers, you know, what's going on there as far as, you know, getting inside the head of opposing hitters, you know, ongoing rivalries, you know, how, how, how you can, how a catcher can and be the field general and have a role in, you know, affecting the other team before you even play the team, things like that. You guys have any like research going on there? It it's almost sounds like you need to hear about the leadership and management tactics that Dr. Pat was talking about, because you sound like you want to get to the to the CEO level of your team. Um, I know you're already a great technician behind the plate. You know, we know you throw guys out, you got a cannon back there, you get on base. You just need the leadership stuff. I appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks for that. Thank, I was actually asking for like some of the research maybe, <laughs> yeah. but I appreciate the feedback. I digress. Dr. Yeah. Ivy, you're yeah. up. Yeah. yeah. Corey, I, something that I've been fascinated with. Well, let me give you a little bit of background. <clears throat> you know, as a strength and conditioning coach, I uh, felt like we had pushed our athletes to the point where we had achieved a lot of potential. Then there was the sports psych side. There was the side, how do we use this thing inside of our heads to help us to achieve another level of mastery? Yeah. And, and, I, and I felt like we, we, we achieved that. But now there's something else that I'm, I've got my eyes on. It. It's mental health. And what are you seeing in your role, in your position, that says this? Well, I don't want to lead you too much. What are you seeing in your role around mental health? Yeah, so th that's a great question. That's something that we've had a lot of internal discussion about, especially with this past year and a half or two years. I don't know how long it's been. The calendar doesn't flip over the same, I don't think, anymore. But um, we were two years ago not talking about mental health at all. We were talking about, um, you know, in the Olympic side, we did a little bit with certain sports that had histories of either um, body image issues or eating um, and amenorrhea, things like that. Those are kind of well known if you've been around a sport like that usually they're aesthetic sports but in baseball you know two years ago we weren't talking about mental health we were really trying to talk about m mental skills and now coming out of the pandemic we've had to really talk about how are we now changing that department landscape to be able to provide more support mental health wise and really be able to tell at every level so you know as you you alluded to before with strength and conditioning being on the ground level creating all the context we also have the athletic trainers around that are always there and a lot of time with their hands on an athlete and usually one of those two will be the first to have any insight that something's not quite right with a player and as you know with both mental health and mental skills it's still a very um, emotionally driven concept that you have players that you can say it's clear you need this and yet the player doesn't want to engage because you know who wants anyone playing around in your head I always that's the the perception out there right and so I remember an Olympic medalist who would talk to me for hours in the gym about all the reasons why they needed this stuff and then when I recommended our our people in that department would say yeah no I don't want anyone talking to me about this stuff and you'd be like you just told me for hours how much you think and you know you need to work on that part of the game so um it's always been something that's slightly taboo. That's really hard to get full scale um, commitment from athletes to engage in. But now what we've tried to really orient is how do we now push people into buckets where we're more proactive in, in getting more of a, a mental health area where they can talk to about, it's a slightly different range of, we'll call it problems and conversations than the ones that are more about optimizing, you know, that uh, field general, controlling a game, being out on the field and, and uh, being able to repeat your pitches, you know, 90 times in a row without worrying about what's going on around you. Um, and that's something that honestly, I probably wouldn't have really thought of if, if COVID didn't bring a lot more to the forefront where people struggled, you know, between not playing their sport was a big one, right? That's an identity, identity crisis, 
not being around the support networks of just like teammates, friends, and family is obviously a big one. Um, so that's something that's we're talking about. I wouldn't say that we've solved it yet. Um, it's very much in the process, but that is something where to your point, Dr. Pat, it's like, we weren't talking about how much we needed to care about mental health before. It's almost like our guys are normal. They just need to perform better on the field. And now it's a lot more awareness around, you don't know what normal is or isn't until you've reached certain conversations. And luckily, you know, empowering the strength coaches and, and athletic trainers to know who to talk to if they see something that might seem like a, we'll call it a flag or a, or a sign that something's not quite right. Um, because we end up having the most conversations with them, right? Is in the training room, in the weight room, when there's so many time with those players and sometimes one-on-one, one-on-two sessions, you learn when someone's struggling with stuff outside of, of their sport and at home and things like that. And to be able to not just go, oh, that's too bad. That sounds sounds bad. Uh, unfortunate for you, but to be able to go with someone and say, hey, let's see if we can set up a conversation with them and see hopefully it goes somewhere where we can help. Um, that's been that's been a huge point of conversation internally these last couple of months. I think that's fascinating that two years ago you weren't talking about it. The pandemic happens. And then it's not necessarily you're talking about um, different types of testing, uh, different types of modalities or whatever it is. It's the mental health yeah. that you're concerned most with at this point in the aftermath. So a question I have for you, Dr. Reimer, as a sports scientist, when it comes to mental health, I think in the past, people would assume if they knew what sports science was at all, that there was a separation between sports science and mental health. Where are you as a, as a sports scientist with mental health? Yeah, I, I, I think that mental health has actually become one of my biggest focuses, at least here, because if you're approaching your work as a sports scientist in a way that you simply want to provide a scientific skill set and introduce scientific processes toward providing a solution, then to me, it goes into this realm of like evidence informed practice where you're understanding the needs and beliefs of others. You're going in, you're picking the brains of those who have expertise in this area. And then you're consulting the, the peer reviewed literature on what works. And so with, my work, it's been really fascinating, at least in these recent months, how you go to a coach and you say, hey, I'm a scientist and I study issues in order to find knowledge, in order to bring innovations to our, our practices to improve our outcomes. What are you facing? So many of our coaches are talking about mental health. So it forces me to go, okay, how can I apply a scientific methodology to mental health? And probably one of the, the most interesting concepts that was introduced to me by someone we have on campus is this idea of a multi-level prevention approach where your mental performance training or your mental health methodologies are being introduced at every level of an organization directly to the patient or the athlete but also to the support staff, the coaches, even the administrators, everyone who has contact to, with the athlete. That's, that's been a really interesting concept that I've started to dive into to try to find the scientific merit for it. And it, it would appear that there is research to support that approach. Maybe for Corey or even Dr. Pat, like, could you comment on your feelings around possibly this idea of a multi-level approach to mental skills training or mental uh, health services to athletes? I'll, I'll go first, but I'll throw it to Dr. Pat really soon because this is obviously a specialty of his and he's going to have a ton of, of, of great perspective, I'm sure. But I think in just a global setting and scale, anytime we talk about the culture that you want and the behaviors you want to foster or eliminate, it has to be multi-level and it has to be organizationally driven for to truly have success and if we just go back to a parallel of anything that's like 
athlete monitoring, if it's acute chronic workloads, things like that. You know, if the strength coach is trying to control workload and then the baseball coach isn't, it doesn't work, right? And that's where you have to start getting this consensus on what you're trying to apply to athletes. And I think the same is true on the mental side about messaging, you know, and it's not always that every person at every level has a skill set to teach the appropriate mental skills or mental health initiatives. But if every coach at every level is sensitive that this is a thing that's happening and that maybe there's there's like workshops on types of language you just try and stay away from, you know, that maybe no one thought about 10 years ago, or maybe if it's how often do you, you know, set up a certain scenario where players feel comfortable to talk and talk to a a coach and tell a coach that he's struggling like Dr. Pat talked about playing in the pros and I'm sure when you talk about being a professional athlete and Olympian sometimes the vulnerability to say I'm having a hard time with this is probably sounds like you know career suicide right like the idea is like you're supposed to be this this rock solid athlete who can do anything you don't want to go and tell your coach that you're having a hard time with training camp you know the laugh you out of the room is was the perception before and to get to a place where you know all of our minor league coaches for example and pitching coaches can see when someone's struggling and instead of just talking about technical aspects of the game to be able to say are you okay with this are you handling this okay do you need support do you need help I think it's something that will require training and empathy but should be modeled from the top down and otherwise it's just you're going to have one practitioner who's got tons of empathy and does well with the players, but then they go out on the field and a coach yells at some them something about, you know, do your job or else. And that eliminates all of that. So I think the multi-level is brilliant, but it would require a little bit of, you know, greasing the wheels to get everyone in your organization thinking like, Hey, this is part of my job now is to not necessarily be a specialist, but to just make my messaging aware that this is out there. And that the one thing I find fascinating about baseball is that, you can have an 18 year old and a 28 year old ones at you know, the Arizona complex league playing against other rookies. And they're so far from the show that it doesn't matter. And then the other guy is literally at Wrigley field, 40,000 people, seventh inning of a playoff game. And they can have the exact same thoughts around, man, I just can't hit right now. Like, why can't I hit this goddamn ball? The ball looks so small. And that's something that you talk about research to reviews. There are research articles around that, around confidence, where people actually perceive the ball to look smaller or bigger based on all these other confidence factors and competence. And um, the crazy thing is, is like the 18 year old's got the same thing going through his mind at the low level that the 28 year old does. And if we can all start to be aware that those are happening at times and it's okay to talk about it, I think that would go a long way. So I'm going to pass the mic to Dr. Pat because this is his specialty. I love that perspective. That's, that's amazing. Um, when you talk about the, the multi-level approach, why, why, what I like to do is maybe take a look at something that's already in existence or, or should be, let's just talk about nutrition. That should be a multi-level approach. Um, from the owner to the um, of an organization, the management coaches, the um, health and performance team. So the nutritionist, the athletic trainer, the strength and conditioning coach, the athletes, position coaches, directors of operations. Everyone should have some general knowledge of nutrition because you can spend all your time teaching the athletes about nutrition and the strength and conditioning coaches don't don't reinforce the message. It, it only goes so far. Or some of our wonderful operations people just everywhere, some of the, the, the most hardworking people may not have the best nutrition habits, right? So who orders the food on the road sometimes? Yeah. The directors of operations say, well, they're just going to look up a place and whatever fit within the budget. And yeah. the next thing you know, the majority of your meals on the road, nutrition quality may not be what it should be. And so that's how, if we looked at mental health, like we should look at nutrition, then we would understand that from administrators, owners, managers, uh, personnel, people, the recruiting department, the personnel department, the staffing, position coaches, 
graduate assistants, strength coaches, nutritionists, sports scientists, mental. If, if everyone has a good base of base of knowledge of what mental health is, then like you said, that becomes part of your culture and environment that, that is nurturing because people have a good base of knowledge and, and it's something that people can talk about and integrate into their normal routines. And now it's not taboo. Now it's not something that you stay away from. It's, there's a stigma attached to it. It just becomes who you are, just like eating healthy, fruit and vegetables. That shouldn't be something people don't talk about. Oh, I don't want to talk about spinach. Like that, that doesn't make sense. And, and the same thing it should be for, for uh, mental health. Uh, <clears throat> so I love this conversation because it is hopefully sparking some different thought processes around what it is to be in athletics and work with athletes. So I, I appreciate that question. Um, I would, I would come back to you, Corey, and say, if you could, if you had a magic wand, what, what would some of this look like? Um, this integration, not just mental health, but your role, your job and what you do. Yeah, I think there's a few things. I think one of the things we didn't mention just there that I think we as practitioners can also be more aware of is I'll give an example of like any monitoring, which a really comp common one now is, is counter movement jumps on a force play. That's something I've been able to play around with a lot over the years. And a lot of times when people write about it and talk about it, they very specifically say, this is fatigue monitoring, right? When they talk about jumps, but that's not true. It's, it's literally a performance in the moment and you're trying to extrapolate what happened right now based on what's happened before. And then people make assumptions about, Oh, he must be tired if he jumped low or did that. And there are ways to map out, you know, how we load athletes with that. But what we don't think about often is that it is literally all just a circle of stress. Right. And we should be more aware of as practitioners, if we start to use tools like that of, the performance isn't where you expected it to be. Part of it is the response of training yesterday or poor eating habits or poor sleeping habits. But there's also a huge envelope that could be this mental stress. Like your jumps could be bad right now. You're eating fine. You're sleeping. But you literally are stressed about, you know, these mental health things. And we don't ever talk about why a person is stuck with that being mental. You know, we forget that this is just all stress pushing into performance. And I think we get really caught up sometimes of thinking like, oh, it must have been what we did yesterday in the weight room. We're just going to modify tomorrow. But if we get stuck there, like we should be able to pull back and go, what else might explain it? Another way that this is comes about is, is body weights. You know, there's a lot of sports where we're trying to get people to put on muscle and get bigger or stronger. Body weight gets stuck. The first thing we do is blame the athlete. And it's like, are you talking to the nutritionist? Are you doing that? What are you eating at home? Are you sleeping? But man, if I'm stressed like crazy, I guarantee you I'm not getting jacked. Like I'm, my body weight's going to stay low because we know it affects your mood. It affects your eating. It affects your appetite, affects everything. So to be able to zoom out and it just be part of our conversation as practitioners, that one of the reasons why this looks the way it does, because, you know, we're all unpacking this on a daily basis in high performance sport of, okay, this person is down here. I want them to compete up here. What do I have to do to get them there? Sometimes it's a new training program. Sometimes it's rest. Sometimes it's change this. But we rarely go into that side of the equation and go, is there something on that stress mental side that might be impacting this performance? And their habits might be okay in nutrition. It might be okay in training. And we might have to have that question. Hey, are you okay? What else is going on? How are you, how are you holding up? How are you doing things? So if we can start as practitioners to consider that as an option, I think it goes a long way. Not that we can prescribe certain things, but be aware because they may say, no, I'm really struggling with X. And then you go, now this is where I refer, right? I refer out. But I think we get really like zoomed into this idea that the performance monitoring stuff around jumps or questionnaires is related to just like the load of yesterday and what I should do tomorrow. And it's, it becomes very, 
uh, stuck, but it's like stress is a huge role there and, and being more aware that it could come out off the field or out of the weight room, I think is something that we as practitioners, you know, in the Cubs and, and everywhere, I think need to be more mindful of and start to think about like, this could also be impacting a guy. Someone should strike up a conversation and that's how it starts. Right. You, and then the other thing sports science wise is we also forget that pretty much everything on the mental side can be quantified. There's, there's like validated questionnaires for everything. We talk about, uh, you know, grit scales and sleep and confidence and perceptions and mental health. There's so many validated scales in those fields that we, we don't really know about in strength and conditioning and physiology. And we forget like we can measure the character stuff. We can measure stress stuff. We can measure whether they're struggling with something. And most of the times people will show this on a questionnaire and um, you know, getting to organizations to a place where that side's not just purely, you know, we'll say subjective, but that there's actually some measures in place to say, Oh, this guy definitely shows X. And we're going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that we can also go to. That's really good stuff, Corey. I, I might just make one comment about that with the monitoring, whether it be a counter movement jump or anything else, is that I, I think sometimes we're just a little bit too quick to say, hey, this person had a bad jump test. Yeah, you know, we got to go start changing a lot of stuff. This, this person says they're not feeling motivated today. We got to go change a lot of stuff. A lot of times I feel like when someone comes in, they may be in both either a physical and or a psychological state that me that suggests they're not ready to go yet, but there's still time to get them ready before we, you know, yeah. but before we ditch the effort, maybe, maybe there's some things we can do to help get them ready to be productive in today's physical activities, whether that be training or practice or a competition uh, honestly i feel like we could have this conversation all day and you know that Corey, you and i have had a lot of conversation where we've you know gotten carried away but maybe um we can turn it over to dr ivy if he's got any last questions or anything for us or for you you know i, I think back to when we were incorporating a lot of the sport psychology into the weight room. And we were, so as, as strength and conditioning staff, we were educated and we were part of the education with our, with our athletes, created a really interesting dynamic back and forth in the weight room. So with our more mature athletes, we would have, we had a multi-level system. The conversations that we would have with the older athletes, when they knew like we taught them about their, their central nervous system. We were doing velocity based training. We were doing, um, auto regulatory. So we were, they understood that there were times when they were going to stand on the platform and they weren't firing. It wasn't about the weight on the bar anymore. The, the, we had a trust with each other and they would say, coach, I just don't have it today. And we knew that there was an understanding and a trust between us to say, when do you think you'll have it? And they would say, oh, I'll be ready. It's Friday. I'll be ready Monday. It's like, well, we don't, we don't, we're not going to do this lift on Monday. Coach, I promise you, if you let me do it on Monday, I promise you, it'll be a PR. And 90% of the time, whatever they did, to not be ready Friday or what went into their life, they knew they were going to have a chance over the weekend to fix whatever it was, come back Monday, pow, hit a PR. Like to me, that's fascinating when you can help them to understand the physiology of what's going on in their body, how their muscles fire, the central nervous system, the psychology behind it, educating them on rest and recovery and what state they're in and, and stress. We would teach them about stress. We called it money in the bank. And certain things cost money, certain things put money in the bank. So they knew they were educated on that. And to, to be in that environment, you're gonna be forced to learn. 
as a coach and a practitioner, when you give them that much autonomy and education, I wish more of us would do that. I wish more of us would trust our athletes because they're so much more capable than just following a sheet of three by eight, four by six, 55, 65, 75%. They're so much more capable than that. You're opening up quite a can of worms for me Uh, right there. I mean, sometimes I, I'll use this perspective out on college campus, right there on college campus, we have a rec center. Hundreds and thousands of college students will go into that rec center, maybe even on a daily basis, without any formal opportunity to work with a coach or a trainer. And they are motivated to attend. They figure out what they're supposed to do to meet their own goals. And they do it pretty darn safely. I got, I got one more story reference that kind of ties together what Dr. Pat was saying and what you were saying earlier, Ernie. Um, Dana Agar Newman, he's a, a sports scientist and strength coach over in Vancouver Island uh, in Victoria. He worked with uh, the Canadian Sports Center Pacific for, for a very long time, and now I think he's running all the SNC, similar role to you, uh, Dr. Pat, in, in University of Victoria. But he was working with um, women's rugby sevens, uh, going into the Rio Olympics where they won a bronze medal. And after the fact, they took a ton of their information, which was like volume load of their workouts. It was uh, vertical jumps, I think once or twice a week. They had RPEs, they had distances run on the field, and they had questionnaires every day. And they basically mined this for like the Olympic cycle with a a guy who's a phenomenal programmer, can do all sorts of this uh, stuff way beyond most of our scope in, in terms of stats. Um, and what they found was the biggest predictor of their improvements in the vertical jump was one question on their, uh, self-assessment or whatever you want to call it today each day. And it was, uh, how do you feel your training is progressing? And I just think that's so fascinating because, you know, it's partially perception, you know, it's part confidence. Obviously it's also reflected on the physical side. Like if your training is going well, you can feel you're stronger, you're you think it's going better but you know when you talk about a person being ready and saying like hey i can do this today and i'm ready to go and i want to crush it and doing it on their terms that's also a huge aspect of of what we do and sometimes we we miss the boat on that you know i i find in rehab scenarios guys jumps and stuff even if it was like an upper body injury will be low at first just because they're in this sometimes they're in this mental funk of like, I'm hurt. I can't play my sport. And you're like, your legs are fine. Why did all of a sudden our performance go down? And usually it takes a moment where they can now be functional back to where they were usually related to their sport that then the jumps start shooting up again, because they're just the confidence of like, Oh, I'm getting close to playing my sport where sometimes I'm like, your legs were fine. You didn't hurt your legs. Why are our jumps down all of a sudden, you know, but it goes back to that side of perception is such a big aspect of how we eventually perform well i think we should wrap this one up um because i think we hit another gear here in the last five minutes (laughs) and we're not slowing down so appreciate everyone here dr reimer um corey uh it's been a pleasure great getting to know you and having this conversation thank you so much for having me thanks a lot corey it's always great to hear from you and interact with you. I mean, it all, it goes back to our very first experience, right? We didn't even know we, we were going to develop a friend, a friendship, but you know, like we had a tiger and there was a repeated sprint test. You were in the front row and we got it done. Didn't we? We did indeed. That was a, at a, an early rhyme presentation at an NSCA. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You all take care. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Happy Thank you. New Year's gents.